Hey guys, I'm really excited about today's video because I'm sort of merging worlds here. I've got my guitar YouTube stuff and my work composing stuff and I get to smash them together today uh, in the form of an interview and conversation with mastering superstar Stefan Marsh. Yay! Uh, Stefan has been crushing it for decades across uh, genres of mastering. He's done a lot of TV soundtracks uh, like The Arrow, that kind of DC stuff, Narcos, uh, awesome metal like Megadeth. He does a lot of live shows. He's done Jeff Beck, Keb Mo. He has done uh, Kenny Loggins. And I met him when he mastered uh, a live album that I uh, mixed from John Sykes, which was super scary because it was uh, one of my first sort of like stepping out onto my own kind of uh, projects. It was That project was plagued with so many technical problems. We finished the first couple mixes, which were rough mixes really, and the Pro Tools rig crashed completely. So we lost all of that and the files. They just got corrupted. This is old school technology here. And so that's the sound of the album. Okay, now we gotta match the rough mixes, which uh, we were mostly done, but not exactly quite done. And then Stefan came in at the end and he did like some amazing mastering wizardry and was flipping phases and ins and outs and, and it sounds great. So I was so appreciative of that. And it was so cool to see like this guy come in and just do his work the magic. Uh, and then he's also done mastering for me on the Forza Motorsport uh, scores. So if you want to hear some of his stuff there, uh, it's the Forza Motorsport 7 soundtrack. Uh, after the interview, I'll post a uh, before and after of some of Stefan's handiwork that he's done mastering for me. Uh, one of the tracks is a, a new track that I cut with Robert Baker. So, um, yeah, stick around after the show. So, thanks for watching. Let's go talk to Stefan. Okay, Stefan Marsh, uh, thank you for being here. I'm super excited about this. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. What do you do? What is a mastering engineer? Uh, like, uh, in the olden days, um, I think there was probably a lot more... Uh, you were the gatekeeper of getting your, all of your tracks onto a CD or onto an album. But especially nowadays, wh what, is your, what is a mastering engineer? So it's sort of like... I always sort of say that the mastering is sort of threefold. You have... The creative elements, the stuff that people think of is like when you think of mastering, it's like I think in a modern sense, people think of like I got a laptop and I get some nice stereo plugins and and I just sort of put a nice sheen on things. But and that's that's sort of like the fun part. We do it with an analog console and some plugins, but that's sort of the, the creative part. But you also have the the diagnostic part where you're inspecting the audio, making sure that the format is correct, the stereo uh, mono relationship is correct. Uh, there's no anomalies, dropouts, ticks, pops, bumps, thumps, um, swear words that shouldn't be in songs that aren't supposed to have swear words. All those kind of things get done. And then there's the clerical aspects, and that's the metadata, the coding, the conforming, and the output. Um, making sure that when I get label copy, which is just sort of label copy is a description I get from the label that is literally everything that will be printed in the booklet or anything that will be attached to it metadata-wise or attached to it visually on, 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 uh, online. So it's the writing credits, the producer credits, the musician credits, engineering credits, all of these things, all that will get coded in um, and all that gets done in mastering as well. So it's almost like the gatekeeping functions have really gone up. And of course, we're still cutting vinyl as well. So we, mm. we do that, on, which is thankfully metadata free, except for what you write on the box outside after, you've done, after you're done cutting it. So When you're uh, jumping over to the vinyl, uh, when you're mastering for vinyl sonically, is that a completely different headspace than if you were going to master for streaming or CD? It, it is and it isn't. Um, it de and it depends on what your goals are. I mean, our goal is to make... My goal with the master with the lathe room is to make really good sounding records. I really don't want to just sort of get things done. And that, if that means that what I've done in the digital treatment doesn't really translate to the vinyl well on playback, then I, then I do more work. And sometimes it gets more complicated, but for the most part, what we've done is we've we've had to modify our workflow over the years, as thing as you do, and we're now in a high res workflow.
because so many labels require high res and because we're getting so much high res or analog sources in for mastering. So, so when you say high res, what do you mean specifically with that? We're at 3296 PCM. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, that's next level. <laughs> yeah, we work everything 3296 uh, PCM in the box. So, and we work all within one. We I work in a pyramid system, and it's all within one workstation. Whereas most mastering engineers will work what they call pitch catch, meaning you'll play back out of like a Pro Tools mm -hmm. or on a Logic or something, and then you'll capture into a, a Sadie or a Pyramix or something like that. We actually work all in the box, and one of the one of the really powerful things about Pyramix is it has amazing sounding sample rate conversion, which allows me to run my session at 3296 and pull all my source files into the same session regardless of what sample rate they, they might be at, mixed included. Mm. So I can pull all various sources. You get a project sometimes, if I get a 16441 wave on this song, I got 2444 wave on this song, I got 2496 AAFs for these next five tunes. I pull everything into one session, it syncs all up, and I'm able to capture within the same session at 3296. Any plugins that I'm using digitally will operate in 3296, so you get much better headroom. Um, no trunk, you don't get the layers of sort of truncation um, air that, that build up over time or dither that can build up over uh, over multiples, you know, successive courses of digital processing. So it creates a really big, clean, clear, open sound. Um, and the uh, and I've got drifted off a little bit, but essentially when you're when you're mastering for digital, uh, when you're in that workflow, instead of just tr capturing the traditional sort of digital capture like we would where we play back through the console and capture the master. We actually capture two. We capture one set of, of uh, files fresh out of the console. And I don't run my console real hot. And some master engineers, it was popular maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to sort of clip your console or drive your console really hot in mastering and get it to sort of bloom a little bit. And that's a cool sound. You get the transformers activated and that sort of thing. It was never sort of my thing, but you can do it and it's it's cool. It sounds good. but. I generally tend to these days run my console very cool, so I just get the flavoring that I want without sort of imparting any transient reduction or any smearing that you get when you get really aggressive on the A to D. So by running it cool, I capture back in a fully dynamic waveform that has all the dynamic, unless I've done any compression on the outside of the box, which I don't do a ton of. Um, it has all my EQ treatment, but none of the limiting that's going to sort of like pump the level up. And then I take those files and do an internal bounce at the same time in real time through digital plugins. So limiter, if there's anything else that I need to, I to add to it there. Um, and then I capture that as well. And that, the, So essentially I'll create a set of digital files that are a little hotter and have the limiting on it, mm -hmm. which will work better for streaming and work better for if it's going to do a CD release or that kind of thing. And then I also have a fully dynamic set of waveforms that, I, that have all the tone and all the sound that I wanted to impart with any, without any of the level. And those generally cut better. And uh, and that's just something that I've learned over the years. It's just having a more dynamic... Square waves don't cut as easily. I mean, you, I shouldn't say don't cut as easily. You can cut them, but the playback is not as appealing. and It doesn't sound as good if you cut the square wave file versus a fully dynamic waveform. Mm. A guy that's mastering his own stuff in the box or something, they may throw on like all the transformer and saturation plugins and really try and carve in a whole identity into the sound and i don't feel like you Im impose an identity yeah i i unless i'm unless i'm invited to i mean i like interestingly enough this morning i was working on a project that was very much that um where we're trying and that's when you sort of pull out i that's when i sort of pull out more honestly digital tools than analog tools that stuff doesn't really happen on my console um and part of that is because it's um because I run the chain cool, I'm not going to get as much color out of it, and that's the reason. Um, but like you said, if you're going to be in the box, that's really where you're going to do most of that kind of heavy lifting. But that's where we break out. Like I love uh, Soothe, and they just came out with the new Soothe too. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you tried that. Yeah, but that I just grabbed. Is, it is filthy good, and it yeah. will. If you have a mix that is just, and you need to transform that thing, it does sort of assassinate your transients, and I think there's a true peak. <laughs> thing going on there or something i don't know exactly what's going on under the hood but my god it when you have a mix that you're really not sure if you can actually pull it out and make something that really sounds pleasing not just okay sometimes that sucker comes through but we'll we use like different digital tools and that kind of thing but i've never tried that on the master bus i had not even considered using it on the master bus i'll have to give it a try you have to be very delicate with it because it does kind of attack things but especially the new one you can really 
the parameters are pretty crazy. And what I tend to do a lot of with is basically DSing. It's, I found it to be an extremely powerful and transparent de-esser. So if I know – that's one thing that if I know I'm going to have to cut the project um, going in, I pay a little more attention to the de-essing than if I know I'm not going to cut the project or if it's not going to be cut. If somebody else is going to cut it, then I assume that they're going to worry about – S's can present an issue to, to a cutting head. And I know what my cutting head will take, but and, if, and every other en- cutting engineer knows what their cutting head will take. So – I. I would lim- I would DS it in a way that would work for my system and be the most transparent. And sometimes that's that's the best way to do it. Mm. Um, so if it's a project that I'm going to cut as well, I pay attention a little more attention to that. I pay a little more attention to the correlation, the left right correlation on the on the low frequencies. But other than that, there's really no and the dynamic range like I was talking about before. But those are sort of the three main areas where you might take a slightly different approach for the vinyl master versus the digital master. So uh, like dynamic range, if someone's going to send you a track. Um, I always have this issue and to go into this anxiety of there are times when I have nothing but a limiter on my master bus and there are times when there's a, a rack of things on my master bus and then I have to send it to mastering and I'm like what do I take off and what do I leave on? How loud do I send it to you? I'm kind of happy with it here but I feel like maybe uh, it, it, you could do better but there's certain things I like. So, you know, what do you suggest when people are going to send you tracks? The biggest thing for me is I, I, I don't have any stock suggestion, frankly, because there's no, because every music is different. And that's why I think a lot of people ask this question. But I think there's a range of answers, and I guess I'll try to present them. On the one hand, um, you can send, what I always recommend is if you have a bunch of processing on the stereo bus, send me that mix but then also just bypass everything and send me the uh, send me the raw mix. Caveat being, if you when you bypass that processing, if the whole mix just falls apart, obviously I'm not going to want to work from that. So don't. There's some mixes where they've they've had so much on the stereo bus. So the stereo bus processing has been multiple and fairly aggressive from such an early point in the creative process that mm-hmm. it's it's now embryonic. In that case, just tell me that. You know, be like, you know, I tried listening, like the mix literally is just, it's not even my mix anymore. So I want, then send me the limited mix. I'm good by that. I'll make it work. Usually the biggest challenge that I have, and the only reason why I would ever say, hey, can you send me a mix that is unlimited if it wasn't offered? And I should say that first. In many cases, most pro mixers these days will send me two mixes. That's kind of become standard the last few years where they know that they know that they're probably outputting mixes for the band to listen to or for the artist to listen to that are hotter than we even need to present for Spotify and these kind of things. So they don't want to put themselves in that box. So they'll give me the limited mix so I know about how loud people are used to hearing it. But they will also, and what their processing is doing in terms of tone and sh- sort of shape. They'll also send me an unlimited mix. Now, that's for guys that sort of like just tickle, you know, like you said, the situation before where it's like you got a DB limiting or something across the bus. Most people don't mind taking that off to give me a slightly less limited mix. The problem that I have with aggressive limiting on the mix is occasionally people will layer limiters and timing constraints, time constraints on a limiter, the act attack and release timings are really, 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 really sensitive when you're talking about stereo program, it is a lot easier to set a attack and release time for a snare drum and get it to sit in the pocket than it is to get a whole mix if you're getting aggressive with it, mm. with the limiting. So what happens sometimes is there will be artifacts, especially in the lower frequencies, there'll be like lower frequency distortion because of the, the time, either way too short a release time on a compressor where things will actually start to pulse a little bit or way too long a release time where you get this unnatural out of phase build up a material and it just sort of gets oozy and w- like whooshy and it that's the biggest issue that i have is it's not that somebody's gotten aggressive with the limiter so they've gotten aggressive with the limiter and they're clearly whatever something about their monitoring environment is not revealing to them these weird artifacts and it's usually in the lower frequencies and that's usually because people are using either two-way monitors that don't have enough low uh, frequency definition or the room isn't, I mean, you know, all the, all the sort of standard reasons why people make poor decisions. It's usually not a creative decision. It's usually just a decision that was made on, on, a, on, a, on a paucity of information. And so that's, what I, that's my issue. So usually I don't actually mind limiting on the stereo mix at all. It's when there's artifacts that I can't undo. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes these days, I, I used to be a lot more purist about it. But these days, if I get something and I can't get an unlimited mix or I can't, if there's a problem with it, where the t- I, I'll use all kinds of tools. I'll throw the kitchen sink at it because my goal is to make the, I just want people to, to listen at the end and go, wow, that sounds great. I don't really care what I do to get it there. And that's what I view my job as. And sometimes that means I just basically run it through the, I call it house dressing, run it through the console, sweeten up the top end, make sure the bottom end is nice and solid and prep it out, get a little bit of level on it. And sometimes I'm like, put it into RX, isotope RX, declip the crap out of it, um, you know, run uh, sometimes phase rotations we have to do, sometimes azimuth corrections. If stuff's gone through an analog console, like invariably the left and right will be imbalanced a little bit um, on, on an older analog console. So because things just drift over time. Um, and a lot of times people, if you're working in an analog console environment, that you will almost always have stereo analog outboard gear on the bus, the SSL compressor or something, you know, LA3As or something, whatever your favorite thing is to stick on the bus. Left-right matching on most recording studio gear is not ideal. It's certainly not close enough for studio or for mastering. So we do azimuth corrections and stuff like that. And again, this is 90% of material we don't have to do any of that to. But there's 10% of material where there's just sort of it's like I said, it's like the diagnostic process of mastering. There's sort of structural issues we have to fix first before we can put a nice coat of paint on the house. Um, and we take a very, I don't get purist about it. I don't, I don't view it as like a, there's most projects where I view it as a do no harm. And I, I one thing I learned, one thing very early in my career, somebody told me that Bernie Grumman had told them during a session, uh, who I hold in extremely high esteem. Um, he said, you know, but the thing about Bernie Grumman is Bernie Grumman respects the mix. And that always, always rings in my ears. If I have a good mix or a great mix that I get to work on, it I always think Bernie Grumman respects the mix, and I always try to sort of that's my that's my motto, you know, as I proceed. There are, but then there are those ten percent of projects where it's like, you know what, this mix is this is here because this mix is not good, and I need to disrespect this mix in all the right kind of ways to get it so that it can sit up and. Most things we can pull around. The technology is so amazing these days with what well, you can do. Like how much can people come to you and say like, this is really rough. I want it to sound like Audio Slave or I want this to sound like Blink-182 or Literally uh, gotten Kanye. both of those references before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it depends. It really depends. I mean, it's, 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 you know, good, good ingredients in, good recipe out. It's that it goes like that. So depending on where it is and how far it needs to go. Um, what I usually tell people is if it's, if on a scale of one to 10, the amount of improvement you need in any given area, if it's a one, two or three, I got you. If it's a four or five strap on your cowboy boots and we'll, we'll, I'm, I'll go for the ride with you. We'll figure it out. <laughs> like if it's above that, it's not going to happen in a remix It's just the proper place to deal with it. And that's the thing is, I try to draw a line on, you know, there's some guys out there that'll be like, ah, just whatever mix you get, you work with it. Stop, don't complain about the mixes and don't demand alternate versions and this. And that's okay. And if that works for you and that's your method, I've, I'm not going to fault anybody for it. But for me, it's at a certain point, the things that I have to do to sort of badger a, a poor mix around into the light, the mix is just the better, it's just the, it's just the better place to deal with the problems. Mm. Um, so it's the sharpest knife. And if, if going back to the mix, if the mixer can pull it up with all the multi channels and nab the squeaky kick drum pedal that everybody's just driving everybody crazy or the uh, clacky upright bass or something like, or send me the track and I'll clean it and send it back and relay the mix. Like, I don't know why I wouldn't do that. What about like a lot of, uh, less experienced mixers, they can get like, oh, I got the bass sound, it's pretty cool. I got the drums, pretty cool. Guitar, everything's pretty cool. I just can't get it together. Does anyone just send you stems and be like, here's my five elements, you mush it together? Yep, all the time. We get stems. We also get 5.1. I do a lot of film work, mm-hmm. and we'll get a very common to get 5.1s, and I'll do the, 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 um, the down mixes here. Uh, many times, because the emphasis is on is not on stereo on the mix down stage when you're doing a film, the stereo almost always gets done sort of after the fact. Sometimes the music editor will do it or something, and it doesn't. They're they're not going to be listening to it or 
in the kind of ways that they're not going to be hearing it the way that I hear it in terms of what I'm listening for. So sometimes it's easier for me to just do that. And in terms of pop music, yeah, stems, a lot of times it's just basic stems too. I mean, instrumental, vocal, isolated, which we almost well, always have. That's we almost always have anyway. The biggest, I think, trouble is like if you're, well, if you do an instrumental guitar album, do I have this lead guitar up with 1 dB, 2 dB, 3 dB, down 1 dB? Because when you're in the car, it sits nicely. When you're on your phone, it jumps out. Like those really subtle things, exactly where to place the vocal. Uh, but you're able to kind of adjust that even sometimes without stems. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can do either going MS, there's some plugins, like the Leapwing audio plugins that let you sort of manipulate the center channel information in a really musical and sort of transparent way. MS on the console, working in mid-side mode where you can operate just on the things in them because where the vocal is typically going to be in the mid. And a lot of plugins these days are also FabFilter has full MS. Uh, Sooth 2 has full MS. Uh, so a lot of plugins now are, are able to operate in that domain as well to really let you drive in uh, or die, uh, dr uh, drill down into the, the center range and, and really manipulate the vocal level. Yeah. Are yeah. you at home? Oh, yeah. Oh my gosh, it, you did a nice deluxe job there. Oh, thanks. We, um, the, uh, it's a building, it's a two-story building behind the house. So I have a shop and an office upstairs, bathroom upstairs, and then I have the studio machine room here. And the lathe room is actually in the house. It's actually a storeroom off my garage because um, we couldn't, the lay, it's like three quarters of a ton. We couldn't get it up wow. here. So, so uh, would you be able to master with your computer, maybe a couple pieces of hardware, in a bedroom, not where you have, you can't bring your nice speakers. Is it possible to master at home? Yeah. Yeah, I've done it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it depends on the material. Uh, it is a little limitation. And like I said, with my console at this point, I would say that I spent like the first 10 years of my uh, career. I mean, you remember the console I had yeah. 15 years ago. It was one of everything in it. Um, it, since then, I've just thinned and thinned and thinned and thinned. And I just, some stuff has, you know, I don't find a need to have outboard digital Weiss boxes or a Waves L2 or sort of the old hardware. So all the digital hardware, the Z-Sys stuff, all the digital hardware has gone the way of the Dodo. And then analog gear as well. Anything that was su super, super clean, I kind of got rid of most of that. Because huh. I'm doing all that work in the box anyway. It sounds better, and there's no reason. At 3296, there's really no reason not to use an amazing sounding plugin. The DMG stuff, the Fab Filter stuff. This, will, I mean, pick pick a color. I mean, it's, there's almost not there's almost not any bad plugins anymore when you think about it, are there? Yeah, it's pretty. So, weird. but you, um, so there are a couple pieces of hardware that I sort of need for my sound, as it were, that sort of just make my job easier. Color pieces, but other than that, my the Pyramix works on a laptop and. Um, and I, I like to have at least a small set of monitors. A lot of one of the big challenges of, mi of mixing is get, knowing how where to place the vocal, the vocal level against the instrumental. And I think one of the big big reasons for that is because people are monitoring on headphones, or they're monitoring on um, two way speakers. Most common, you know, midfields in a studio are going to be two ways. So you inherently have a crossover between the tweeter and the mid, right on top of or right around the vocal range. And it affects your perception of the level of the vocal. Mm. You really need to get it on a set of three ways where you have one driver dedicated to that range of frequencies mm. to understand how it relates to the other frequencies. And that's so I can master on a laptop with just a couple pieces of gear, but I can't do it on headphones. Mm. Is is that that's the one challenge for me is I do need at least a small set of three ways. So I have in this room I have a big set of PMCs in my main studio. I have a studio in Virginia. I have a house in Virginia that has a small, like I call it my vacation studio. Mm -hmm. That has a set of three-way ATCs. Again, a smaller set. Um, and then in the lathe room, we have a three-way set of Dynaudio, the lid, uh, lid 48s. Um, and I have to, I can't, I just can't. I have a set of BM15 two-way Dynaudios up here in the studio as well. But I can't do just, I can't do just those. Like, I, I got to have a three-way speaker. Gotcha. So a lot of people think mastering is just for like labels indie labels uh, record labels but like there's different price points i mean it's not a five dollar but you're not up on fiverr saying i'll master your stuff but even if you have a, a home project that you're going to put out 
yourself or you're just going to throw it on YouTube or something that is important to you. I think there's a big difference and a lot of uh, improvements that can be made to most uh, home mixes or people at that level. Even professional people that are putting out a, just an independent sort of a, a release, like yeah. to get that second set of ears, a lot of these projects are going to be one guy working on the whole thing. Then to finally have someone else come in and go like, oh, you know what? You're really pounding this frequency pretty hard, or I could round this off, or this whole thing will kind of warm up or balance. I think there's a lot to that. Um, so you have scaled structures of of uh, like projects and how you you would that you would take on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the the thing that I always try to remind people is it's it it's about making an investment in your career and an investment in your art. Um, and there are projects that come in, I won't lie, that come in that sound really good to begin with. And I'm really just sort of putting the cherry on top. There are other independent projects that come in and, and at the end of it, the artist and I sort of look at each other and go like, wow, I'm, I'm really glad I'm here. You know, <laughs> like I'm there. And I, that makes me feel good. Like when somebody looks at me and says, I'm really glad I'm here and they feel like their cost, for me, it's all about cost of value and my what drives my wife crazy, but it's not about how much something costs. It's about how much value you present to the artist. Yeah. And if you present a lot of value to the artist, then you're no longer expensive. And that's the trick is I, I don't, my rates aren't low, but, but I am cheap in my, in my mind because I'm not, uh, because of the value, the amount of value that I try to provide to the artist. But in our shop, we, we do, we tier the pricing. Um, so depending on what I'm doing, if it's something that I'm, if it's mastering work, then there's an hourly rate. If it's editing work, I have two other engineers that work with me here, and they will handle the lion's share of that. So I'm able to offer that service at a discounted rate. And they are they also master at discounted rates off of our, you know, we have a house hourly, and then um, my other engineers operate at a discount off that hourly. And that's something that almost every mastering shop that has, unless it's a one-guy operation, almost every mastering shop has additional engineers that work at discounted rates. And that's what I would say if somebody is sort of on the fence about going to professional mastering sort of versus like a guy with a laptop or not doing it at all um, is reach out to a couple of well-known mastering houses and see about, you know, say, Hey, I'm an indie artist. Do you have any, do you have any alternatives that are, that might be more affordable or more uh, accessible to me? Cause invariably you're going to find, like my guy, my my primary assistant here, Justin, has been with me six years now. Like, trust me, he he knows what a good record sounds like and what a bad record sounds like, and he'll do a great job in the same room that I work on the same gear, um, same monitors, same acoustics, everything. And with the introspection of six years of sitting at my side, listening to me work with artists and different kinds of music and things, so there's a lot of value that he can provide and at a rate that is going to be very approachable for a lot of artists. And I think that's the same with a lot of mastering studios. So that would be my thing. If you, if you are afraid of, if the, if the card rate for the guy's name who has his name on the door scares you, or the woman who has her name on the door scares you, then inquire because almost every studio has other engineers. And how, how would they just email you through your website? Yeah. For me, it's just hit me on the website. Um, or they can, I, I'm not sure if the engineers have their emails direct on the website or not. Um, uh, we're about to just do like a huge overhaul of the website. So, all right, we're going into the speed round here. Cool. Where did my speed round questions go? Oh, uh, come on, man. Oh man. I'm going to drink more coffee. Yes. Okay. I think you just answered the first one. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Angels or Dodgers? Angels. 48, yeah, I know. 48, I know. I see, I've seen your Instagram. I know. Uh, 48K <laughs> or 96K? 96K. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Trek. Stereo or 5.1? Stereo. Vodka or scotch? Scotch. Read a book or watch Netflix? Uh, Netflix. Mac or PC? PC. Vinyl or CD? Vinyl. Vinyl. All right. That's it. I think you there win. There we go. Hey. <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> Stefan, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Uh, um, pleasure was all on my side of the table, man. Uh, Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll be in touch. Cheers. Talk all right. to you soon. Bye. Bye, buddy. So cool. Thanks for sticking around. Now I could show you uh, what a real mastering guy does here. So I'll show you some before examples, and then I'll show you what Stefan did.
All right, guys, thank you for watching. Uh, if you have any other questions for Stefan, please put them in the comments below. Maybe I could get another interview with him uh, and we'll do a follow-up. Uh, if you have any questions for me about production, mastering, guitars, obviously, anything, I'm happy to answer them also. Like, subscribe. If you need some mastering done, I'll put all the, the links for Marsh Mastering down below so you can uh, check in with Stefan and see if he's right for you. And uh, if you like this kind of video, let me know because I'll keep doing it. Uh, thank you for watching, guys. See you later.